In this video, we'll be discussing the impacts of changes to the DNA. Mutations are changes in the DNA sequence of an organism. Mutations are going to be the source of new alleles. Sometimes these new alleles will be harmful, causing a genetic disease or cancer. Sometimes the changes are beneficial. allowing a bacteria to no longer be sensitive to certain antibiotics. But most of these mutations are neutral, meaning they're a change to the DNA, but they don't end up impacting the survivability of the organism. So where do these mutations come from? Sometimes there will be mistakes made while copying DNA before cell division. That's something we'll be talking about in the next module. Sometimes there will be specific physical or chemical substances in an environment that damages DNA. We call these materials mutagens. And so mutagens or carcinogens, they can cause mutations. While cells have some ability to repair certain types of errors in their DNA, if the DNA is copied before that repair can take place, the new copy includes those changes, and those changes become permanent within that cell's genetic material. So when we look at the types of mutations, which again, a mutation are changes in the DNA sequence, these changes in the DNA sequence can end up causing changes in the mRNA sequence. This again was that photocopy of the information in the DNA. If you're changing the DNA, you're going to have changes in the RNA. And those changes in the RNA might in turn have changes in the protein. And I'd like to highlight three types of mutations. We have substitution mutations, where one letter is changed for another an insertion mutation, where one letter is added into maybe a very long sequence of DNA. It could be thousands of letters long, but adding one letter can actually have very devastating impact. The same with deleting one letter. If you just lose one letter, that can actually be worse than changing one letter for another. And that's what we're going to be talking about in these next few slides here, types of mutations and the impacts of them. Now in a substitution mutation where one letter is changed for the other, in this particular example, looking at the top of the diagram, a place where there was supposed to be a T on that top DNA template, what if there is a C instead? Well, that's called a substitution mutation. And that might end up changing one amino acid. But it's not going to change what's called the reading frame or how we group three letters together and identify that as a codon. An insertion or a deletion mutation, that would mean we are adding a letter or gaining a letter. This does shift the reading frame, and we call these resulting types of mutations a frame shift mutation. And from that point of the mutation onward, the reading frame has changed and that drastically changes the protein that you're making. So a frame shift mutation has a change in the codon reading frame. Remember, each codon is exactly three bases or three letters long. And the next codon starts as soon as the first one ends. Well, if you add a letter or take away a letter, all the reading frames, all the codons after that point are going to be shifted around and no longer coding for the same amino acid. Changes in the reading frame result in severe mutation, which scrambles all of the codons after that mutation. Frame shifts occur when one or two bases are added or lost. 
from a coding section of a gene. To show an example of what a frame to show an example of what a frame shift mutation is like and the impact of these frame shift mutations, we're actually going to use the English language, but assume that there's a rule that every single word has to be exactly three letters long. So we have our initial starting sentence, the fat cat ate the rat. Now the sentence has meaning, there's a specific intention to it. Now let's say we change that C in cat, and we change it to another letter. Say so we change it to a B. Now it says the fat bat ate the rat. Now there's a slight change, but most of the meaning of the sentence is still there. It's a little different than it was, but it's still a sentence. Now let's say at that C in cat, what if we just delete it, but everything has to shift, so we still have three-letter words? Well, we have the fat, that hasn't changed, but then A-T-A, T-E-T, H-E-R. Some of those might be words, but the meaning of that sentence has been lost. No longer are the letters grouped into meaningful words. Likewise, if we add an extra C instead, to add an extra C to the one that's there, we see with our insertion mutation, the fat, and then CCA, TAT, ETA, GRA. Again, none of those were in the original sentence, and the meaning of that sentence has been lost. So insertion and deletion mutations, they have a bigger impact in changing the meaning of a gene than simply substituting one letter for another. In frame shift mutations, These are usually changes in the function of the protein. Frame shift mutations change many amino acids, and often it's normally going to add a stop codon earlier than it should be, so it makes a shorter protein overall. We say that it truncates the protein. These changes to the protein, the shortening of the protein, changing the amino acid, definitely changes the shape of the protein that was made, and therefore changes its function. It usually loses all functionality if there's a frame shift mutation. As opposed to a substitution mutation, in a substitution mutation, these might change one amino acid, or sometimes the substitution mutation happens and the new codon still codes for the same amino acid it did before because of redundancy in that genetic code. These are called silent mutations. But again, typically at most, there will be a single amino acid change. Now that's not to say that certain diseases aren't caused by substitution mutations, but in general, substitution mutations are not going to be as severe as frame shift mutations. So to sum up what we've learned about DNA and how DNA works, genes are inherited as DNA from an organism's parents. That DNA is transcribed into RNA. And that RNA is then translated into protein. This flow of information is known as the central dogma. Of genetics. Proteins give the organisms traits and mutations in DNA produce changes in those traits. So what is it that mutations do? Well, one thing they do not do is they do not give an individual superpowers. A mutation isn't going to cause an individual to suddenly be significantly faster than they were or to have super control over the weather or ability to fly or anything like that. Another thing that mutations aren't going to do, it's not suddenly going to produce toxins in common food items. Those aren't the types of mutations that you need to worry about. Now, with our knowledge of how DNA works and how genetics works, 
we have been working towards trying to modify or improve organisms genetically. If an individual receives genes from another source, from a different species, from a different type of organisms, we call that organism transgenic. A transgenic organism receives DNA from another source. Now, if you want all cells of an organism to have new DNA, you need to add that new DNA when it's at a one cell stage. So receiving a gene from a different source allows an organism to make a protein based on those instructions. This concept of transferring genes from one organism to another is not inherently scary or bad. As humans, we've been modifying the genes of other organisms for thousands of years through artificial selection and selective breeding. All produce and livestock have been genetically manipulated. Transgenic organisms are simply a new step in this technology. It may allow certain types of produce to be resistant to insects. It may allow produce to ripen more quickly or to stay in a ripened state longer before it starts breaking down. Just because modifying an organism's genetics doesn't make it instantly dangerous, it also doesn't mean that modifications should be unregulated or unstudied. Careful study of genetically modified organisms is key for approval. And this, again, is another place in our society where we need to talk both scientists and ethicists, people who understand morals and people who understand science, need to discuss together to talk about what are our goals with genetically modified organisms? What are our goals with transgenic organisms? Does this increase risk? But being scared of it just because it's new isn't helpful, but also not having an understanding of what these changes will do isn't helpful either. This concludes our discussion on the function of DNA.